I'm not. AJ Hinch, manager of the Detroit Tigers, catching us in a great, great time right now. How you doing, yeah. man? You getting ready for hey, uh, winter meetings? Can I drop an Amir Garrett story for you right out of the shoot? Please. Yes, yeah, yeah. please do. So, so when he was with the Royals, um, you know, I, I, I have Javi on my team, and, and, and Todd will remember oh, talking yeah. about, about that. And, and, you know, I'm saying everybody with the – both teams are, like, looking to see if there's going to be this matchup. And we got to the, like, on-deck circle a couple different times, and so the talking was going, and the emotions were flowing or whatever. And then I found myself with Amir in the game and Javi in the hole, standing right next to me on the steps. And the chirping started, started, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I got way too much respect for Amir Garrett. If he runs over here, like, I have no chance whatsoever. And it never happened. They never got to face each other. And then the next day, um, you know, I go out early, sit on the bench, and it's family day, and watching Amir with his, with his kid run around the, the bases, man, I was – it's just amazing to watch these guys as people and then watch these guys as, as, as competitors – um, and I don't think either guy really has any, any total animosity against one another, but the Garrett bias thing almost came to fruition again. Yo, listen, I, <laughs> nice. and those kind of things you think about like the fights back in the day and all that stuff, people, oh. you, baseball players, what people don't understand, we don't forget a damn thing. I remember, <laughs> I remember I got hit in like a B matchup, you know, way back when Raldis Chapman first came. And I always said, and he's, he's one of my best friends. I saw him the other day, and I always told him, I said, I'm going to get your ass back. And lo and behold, like eight years later, I finally got his yeah. ass. And like after the game, I texted him. I said, I finally got <laughs> your back. And we were, you know, you don't forget that shit. My, hey, my question to you, <laughs> you put that tree up by yourself in the back there? Did you get a little oh, off? Let me, <laughs> let me tell you something. That was planted, like my little Zoom area. Like I got some Christmas spirit. My wife and two daughters were here. <laughs> For uh, for Thanksgiving and and put the tree up. So I didn't touch it. Um, I have nothing to do with it, but I will rock it right behind me on a Zoom so everybody can no feel doubt. a little better about themselves. My wife won't let me touch. The last five times what? I've done it, I've I've broken some ornaments, you know. And and now it's like I hand them to her, and she's like, "Don't put them on the damn tree anymore." I said, "Okay, fine. Do what you want to do." Come on. Hey, so my kids. I've been around long enough now. My kids. I've, I've college age daughters and. You know, we've got ornaments from every team that I played for, every team that I've managed, and they're very conflicted on where they go on the tree. Like, do we put all the yes. old school ones in the back? Do the one I got fired at a couple places. You know, those <laughs> they still go on the tree, but they got to go in the very back. You know, Detroit's <laughs> right in the front center now. Um, and, but as a manager, man, you you got to stay present with who you know who's loving you right now because you never know how long it's gonna last. <laughs> yeah, exactly. hell yeah. All right. Facts. It's about the Tigers right now. Okay, so you got two gifts so far this offseason, right? A big league um, trade and signing. Maeda, Marcana, thoughts yep. on those two? Have you spoken to them? And what's next? Yep. Yeah, both of them are big additions for us for a couple of reasons. One, we have a very young team. Um, and being young doesn't mean being bad. I think Arizona showed that young youthfulness can get through to the finish line, give yourself a bite at the apple, and all of a sudden they found themselves in the World Series. So I think being young um, is pretty exciting in Detroit with some of the young hitters that we have, our young pitching getting healthy. Um, we needed to add some some veteran presence there. So it started with Canna, um, who's been a real nuisance when you're against him in so many ways. In his years in Oakland, I got to see it up close and personal at AL West. Um, obviously, it continues on, and as he ages, he becomes even a better hitter um, you know, maybe the power's a little zapped or maybe he's not, you know, going to play 150 plus games, but the back quality is legit. Um, and then just last week with Maeda, um, you know, he, he was nasty from, the, you know, the, coming off the injury, uh, going through the end of the season. And, and we have a really young rotation. We have, you know, some innings questions going into next season, but he still misses bats. He knows how to pitch. Um, you know, we have a couple of guys on our team that have some history with him back to his Dodger days. I actually drove him around when I was in Houston. Uh, when he was coming over to sign from Japan, uh, I spent a day with him. And he's just a legit dude who, who, can, who can adapt to the style of pitching that, that he needs to. Big ballpark, good outfield defense. He still misses bats when he doesn't give up fly balls. It's like a perfect match for us. Who makes, who makes, who makes a bigger – who makes a bigger uh, – positive impact on the guys around him. Mark Canna with his ability to 
get on base and show your younger hitters like Torkelson and Carpenter and Riley Green how to like be impact bats? Or is it Kenta Maeda who is mm-hmm. going to be able to speak into like a Casey Mize coming back from injury right. and a Tarek Skubal building on what he's already done? So which of those two guys – do you see making a bigger impact? Yeah, I would say Canna's presence is going to be enormous for Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, Kerry Carpenter. Like, um, I love everybody, but I, I think the everyday component of that impact is huge uh, for the for the for the hitters. And we had two years ago, we had Robbie Grossman as sort of a, a veteran guy. Obviously, Javi and Miggy are huge presence in the back corner of the room. Um, but they're not the most vocal guys and, 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 you know, they're sort of regal. Like th- those guys have like an, an aura around them, even though they try to like just be one of the guys. So I think Canna's approach will help Colt Keith get to the big leagues. It will help Malloy when he gets to the big leagues. Matt Veerling is starting to emerge as a pretty good leader. You know, we have some guys that are, that are, that are gelling like, a little bit of old school red ass that I heard Canna has and, and just watching him conduct at bats. Um, that's a lot of at bats that he can impact. Now, just a simple question here. You got these two, what's next? Is there going to be another move for you guys coming up here? Or there's a move that you think is much needed moving forward here to get this Ranger yeah. team, not only to be in second place, but get, get that lead a little closer to the yeah. division. Yeah, so one of the things that was cool last year is we won every season series against our division. So that that was important to me. We hadn't played great in the division my first two years here, and now we start beating up on our own division. You can actually make a make an impact to to potentially win it. Um, but I love Scott came out. Scott Harris came out after the Maeda signing and said he keeps keeps looking for pitching, and that's that's probably where I think the the attention is going to be. Like one of the one of the things we're really trying to stay. Uh, discipline too is giving some at bats to young hitters and we're trying to produce dudes we're not trying to produce just platoon guys that can't handle same side pitching so if we're going to do that like Parker Meadows and Cole Keith and Malloy like I talked about Riley's going to play every day um, I did pinch hitting for him last year against against Aroldis Chapman and he thanked me by the way <laughs> I love that um, <laughs> You know, but though, we need these guys to play, and we can't block them unless we just got a, an offer we can't refuse to, to try to add somebody. So the pitching side, you know, we still have some room to create some competition by squeezing in another starter. Maybe there's another reliever. There's always another reliever. Like, every team always adds a reliever. But um, Scott said that publicly after we signed Maeda, and, and, and I think that's going to be true. Kratz, you there? Oh, maybe we lost him for a sec. All right, then I'll go. Kraz doesn't um, want to talk to me. I've been trying to hire him for years. He won't. He won't come on board. So like, he doesn't want to talk. <laughs> I think we lost him for a sec. Kratz? Yeah, we lost him. All right, I'll take over for a sec. Um, that's amazing. I need to get Kratz's response to that because he's getting heavy calls and we've been holding him tight because you know we pay the big bucks here. That's on right. Live. Um, so AJ, I have you guys as. And I mean this as a compliment, like the Reds from this past season where, and these guys, when they come back, will be able to vouch for me. I was like, the Reds are being severely underrated last year. And they ended up coming short of the postseason. And I can make the case that they got some pitching um, at the deadline. They probably would have put themselves over the top. They were only, I think, a couple games away. So I think you guys are like that team this year that's not getting a ton of looks. But in addition to all of the young talent that's going to take another step, and like you said, probably some more pitching coming along the way. I look at the division and I'm like, AL Central can be taken. You don't need to rebuild for a billion years. And also, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for you, teams have, are taking a step back. You know, like Minnesota, for example, has said publicly, we have to cut payroll this year. The Guardians are going to stay like in a low range in terms of what they can spend. The Royals and White Sox are still not there. Do you look at the division and say, if we don't win the division this year, it's a disappointment. Well, I always think that because I want to win and and I came here to win and we have slowly methodically gotten better. Um, I, you know, one thing I've said very consistently in Detroit during the season is you have to earn the right to talk that way. So you have to, you have to play better. We have not had a great Aprils in my three years here. We're going to focus that on that a ton. We've played great from May 15th to the end of the year and you have winning records and, 
that's cool and all, but you've got to get above 500 before you start popping off about, about wanting to do certain things. Um, do I think there's opportunity? Absolutely. Do I think anybody in a series wants to come in and face Tarek Skubal? No, they don't. Regular season or postseason. So, but you have to do better and play better more consistently and see some emerging players become bona fide big leaguers if you want to start talking that way. We have a path to a win every day. Um, our bullpen's been nasty the last couple of seasons with with a couple of different uh, combinations to get to the to the finish line. Um, but we've got to do more work before we start talking too aggressively. Um, but we're going to show up every day wanting to win, and we're going to show up this season expecting to win and and take that edge for 162 and then total it up. So I'm not in the prediction game, but I I know what our attitude and our mindset and our in our in our in our, in our kind of mojo is doing as a team and that's trending in the right direction we have to prove it to ourselves and prove it to others uh before we start anointing ourselves you know really anything aj how will you handle the psychological portion of the clubhouse with miguel cabrera retiring so sure it sucks and we were just with uh uh casey mize like two days ago at the players party and we interviewed him for a while and he's like, you know, just when he comes in and you're laughing and it's a presence, that's not going to be there. But I also look at the positive end of, Hey, this team's gone through some losing that you guys want to wash away. And who's the next guy that's going to take over the clubhouse, make people feel good, right? Make people feel comfortable. Do, right. do you have anyone in mind or maybe multiple people that can do that? And have you had conversations with those people about how it's going to change with someone like that leaving? Yeah, make the makeup of the clubhouse is completely different because like we can't say this about too many players, but for the last like two decades, this guy has governed this clubhouse and and being that presence and being the the go to guy. And he, he, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't openly talk about is how how great players or big names shield the clubhouse from virtually everything. Like no matter what's going on, like everybody check Miggy's mood, everybody check Miggy if he's in the lineup and where his performance is, whether you're on a good team or on a mediocre team, it kind of shifted all attention to Miguel. And then last year, every stop along the way, we got gifts, you know, from, for Miggy and there was a presentation and, and there was a, um, some of them better than others, but it was fun to, to celebrate him all year. Well, that takes a ton of pressure off everybody and now that's gone so we're going to embrace it the fact that we need to develop our own identity because when they put up where the tigers are playing the white Sox opening day like they can't put miggy's picture on the preview like they can't say miguel cabrera and the tigers and it's going to be somebody different but somebody's got to earn that they don't need to fill miggy's role but they need to they need to step up and and they're going to start having to answer the questions or they're going to start to have to answer you know, the responsibilities that come with player to player feedback, like things that that start winning teams start start doing. Um, and that can come pretty easily with us. Torque breakthrough 30 plus homers. You know, he's got some leadership qualities. Riley Green, like his vibe is energy. Um, everything he does, the way he prepares is awesome. Kerry Carpenter, small little uh, presence, but like big bat, 20 homers, middle of the lineup. Um, everybody goes to Veerling. This dude played center field in the World Series a couple of years ago, and now he's playing a little bit of center, a little bit of right, a little bit of third base for us. Uh, but he's a go-to guy when when guys are struggling. Uh, but now you see a little bit why we added, you know, a veteran guy like Canna to that mix to make sure that there are resources for these dudes because we need our young players to be good quickly nowadays. They get they get raced through the minors and they have to finish their development up in the big leagues and that. That comes with a lot of coaching, and, and my coaches are great. Uh, probably more importantly is the player-to-player -player leadership that has to evolve, and the team will pick the leader. Like, I don't. I'm the manager, and, and I can see who, who has those qualities, but the players will pick who they listen to. I like that. And by the way, Todd Father forgot to pay his internet bill. He just paid it. He did the quick pay. <laughs> They're back. Kratz, I don't know if you caught this, but right before you guys left and you had texted me, you're, you're going to ask him the next question. Um, Hinch said he's been trying to get you on his coaching staff for years, and you're just giving him the Heisman. So what the hell? Wow, me? I never you. got any calls from you, AJ. I don't, I don't know what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, you, you, we, we can go through the log if you want, like my phone log. Please, it's please a, do. No, we don't need to go through the log. These guys give me a hard time. I'm, I'm. Right. We, listen, AJ, I, I lost in the, I lost in the state semifinals for the high school this past year. My first. 
first year is coaching. So you don't want me in there. You're looking to win a world <laughs> series again. You don't, you don't, you want winners. That's what it is, but that's, that's just life. Wow. You got him yeah. bashful no, there, it. AJ. Hey, you yeah, you, you caught him well there, dude. What's I, going no, on here with you? Here's the thing. Like, I'm not afraid to throw a haymaker every now and then. So that was my haymaker to crash. And then, it, you know, when he he, he's going to text it. me on the side and say, hey, man, there was no offense not coming to you. He's going to be very cool about it. Yeah, exactly. Know. You, you know him. You know him too That's well. Right. You would fit perfect there with the big dogs. I, w- I would have loved it. I would have loved it. Yeah. And AJ knows my my affinity for my family right now. And yep. we yeah. are gonna, we're going to continue to talk. But That's so right. That maybe That's you know, right. down the road, we'll continue to talk about this. But my question really is, you talked all about your team. You talked all about this. What's the man in the mirror got to do? What do you have to improve mm-hmm. at? Because yeah. you're constantly about that. You're constantly about like, hey, I got to improve other people. But anybody that I've yep. ever been around that's worth their salt that wants to improve other people has to keep improving themselves. So what do you got to yep. improve? Yeah, so it's an awesome question. And you are, uh, you're 100% right. And we always look at, at what can we do more like someone will say hey, AJ you play the infield in more than any manager in baseball and I'm like but are we good at it like is it good that we play all the time in or like the pinch hitting stuff we we pinch hit a ton last year and so I every year I think the manager whether it's me or anybody else has to adapt their managing style to the players that they have like someone will say hey do you like to steal bases and I'm like well do I have any fast dudes do I have enough primary leads and do they do we have an opportunity to, 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 to be disciplined at the plate to allow stolen bases to happen? So I've got to read my team better, faster in the season. Like I feel really proud about how I've run the bullpen or how I've, I've you know, in the starting rotation, taking pitchers out or, or how active we have or how inactive we've been, we've been with our offense as the season's gone. But I take a ton of accountability for the early part of the season, the last couple of years where we are grinding from the very beginning to try to get our heads back up so that we can take a run at the central. And we've, you don't have to win every single month and have a winning month every single month to win divisions in baseball, but you can lose them in any given month by just totally disappear, disappearing. And so I'm, I'm myself, my coaching staff, we got to read our team faster at what the strengths are. And that's going to come with some unknowns as we, as we, as I said, we're going to be a little bit young and a little bit of inexperience. My job is to push, push the buttons better, faster. And I think that can, that can help our team win more games. So it's been, it's been a few years now, and I, I feel like we could talk about this now. You're in Detroit. Are you happy that the White Sox really didn't, really didn't go <laughs> after you but now that you're in Detroit? <laughs> Man. I, I'll tell you what, every time that we go to Chicago, like I probably was the happiest that they changed the schedule, but I only have to go twice and not three times because like <laughs> every time we would go to the White Sox early on, it was a ton of attention about that. And especially when Tony was there because they had the, the awkward, like Tony's face, my signature. And like, they, they, <laughs> there were some things around Twitter that were messing, you know, messing around. But um, honestly, like I, I couldn't be happier in Detroit and, they have a ton of talent. I know they're going through a transition in Chicago, but you know when you go to a place and and you start to develop relationships and you start to put your fingerprints on it, you're bringing coaches in. I now have a new boss structure with Scott Harris coming over, Jeff Greenberg as a GM. Like pl- places start to feel like home, and and that's how Detroit feels for me. And 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 I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. But that was a weird time in my life in general, coming out of the Houston you know, sign stealing scandal and, and getting any opportunity, man, I was really blessed and lucky to, to get. And, and to have that happen, I'm like, man, I, I just landed in a really good spot. And I love Michigan summers. I love being a Tiger. Um, and I don't have any angst against the White Sox, but I get some free angst because they're in the AL Central and I want to beat them. <laughs> that's, that's fair. What do you, what do you, since, you know, I guess I'm biased. I think you're one of the best managers in the game. What do you look at councils? What do you look at yeah. councils situation? How also another guy that I have a lot of respect for and think is one of the best managers in the game. Also, you, you, I can yeah. have two, I can have two people who are best managers in the game, but yeah, his, no, I mean, his I whole situation. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. And also for counts, man, like congratulations to him. And, and, and that was a unique situation. And, um, and you get, you know, you get mixed emotions on all these jobs. They're hard jobs to get, they're hard jobs to keep. 
Um, I feel for David Ross because I, you know, another good friend of mine who um, was busting his tail as the manager. I got to talk, catch up with him a little bit last year. We played him. You know, there's there's a lot that that goes into into getting these jobs, and then on top of that, when somebody gets a mega deal like that, like if you're willing to get to free agency and you have some things line up um, similar to a player, it can, you know, it can explode, obviously. So um, kudos to him for the deal. David Ross is going to get whatever job he wants moving forward. I hate the kind of hate how uh, emotional that gets at the end. I know everybody's handling it the best they can, but um, I'm proud of counts for standing up for the manager's you know, in that I remember when I first broke in, I just finished my 10th year managing. I feel like an old dude now, but, um, you know, you were, you know, getting paid by um, much, much different than we're getting paid now. So it's uh, very unique to, to have someone go out and, and be that public with his, <coughs> with his pursuit. But he's trying to stand up for a lot of people and and, and hopefully that that triggers some some bigger investment in, in managers. I like that. Uh, free agency is still fine. Players getting paid nicely. So uh, Eduardo Rodriguez is going to get some cash. He opts out. I, yeah. I don't think anyone is surprised about that coming off the season that he just had. Can you describe what it was like mm -hmm. to have him throughout this process? And I know he went through some stuff off the field, got himself back on track this past season. And also, if you can, mix in what went down with the opt out there because it, yeah. it's twofold. Now that he opts out, you're like, damn, you know, it would be nice to get some guys for him when you weren't in the playoff race at that point. So were you surprised yeah. that he said no to the Dodgers? Um, not really. Cause I think, I think when players put, you know, clauses in contracts like that, they're there for a reason and players can exercise them whenever those situations come up. And I, you know, I think every player should stand up for themselves. I think every player should get what they, you know, what they ultimately want. And I think players should play where they want to play. Sometimes you have to, not all those things combine, right? Sometimes you don't get the most money in the place you want to play. So you have a real dilemma on your hands. Other times it works out perfectly. So um, I was close with Eduardo. I'll stay close with Eduardo. We went through a lot of life things together. And, I, you know, I was just a sounding board for him. As a manager, I get close to my players. I, I'm, I'm there for him. He confided a lot of stuff in me. So I, I know a lot about what makes him tick and why, you know, why he's doing what he's doing and, um, even all the way to the finish line, like he was very open with me on, on what he was hoping going to happen. And then ultimately he opted out. So I think he's, you know, he's a really terrific pitcher when he, when, you know, when he gets ahead of hitters, <laughs> when he's really good at, 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 at pumping fastballs and cutters in there and getting guys into swing mode and he can get some really quick outs. And I loved having him on the mound. We felt like we were going to win every game that he pitched. Um, obviously he missed a lot of time one, you know, personal reasons the first year and the, the finger inju injury in the second year. But as a as a manager, you want two things out of your starting pitcher. Number one, you want reliability and you want somebody to get as many outs as they can to leave you a smaller number of outs that you got to bestow on other people. He did both of those for us. So I, I loved having him having him pitch every five days. Prediction time. You have do you know how many wins you have in your career? No. 791 wins. Do you get your 1,000th okay. career win as a manager as a Tiger? Yes. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Love to hear that. To hear that. That's awesome. to, me, that, to me, I think that just how confident you say that, it doesn't mean, oh, yeah, World Series this year or all that stuff. Right. It just means like a continuity for your players, yep. for the front office, for the fan base. All that stuff matters in yeah. a time when we're talking. All we talk about every day is who's going to go here? Who's going to go there? Yeah. Oh, we want this person. We want that person. And the Tigers have a solid rock at their manager position. I think that's, I think that's all. Awesome. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. This is, I'm lucky to be here. I, I also love what I do. I love who I, who I work with. Uh, the player banter is real. You're talking about Casey Mize, like, I hope you guys asked him about Auburn football because I know I did. Oh about yeah! 10 oh yeah! <laughs> after they blew it, so I, that th this these jobs are incredible uh, when you can get the you know get the ball rolling a little bit. You start getting the right people around you. Get the get the get the right the right the right culture. Everybody throws that word culture around, but when you get that right feel, like you guys have all walked in clubhouses and been like, mm, not great. Um, we are the opposite and I, and I think that's a good, you know, stable, you know, baseline for, for what's ahead for this organization. 
Last one for me real quick. So are you a Michigan or Michigan State fan uh, football-wise now? Man, you are this, so you're gonna get me hated by half. The <laughs> <laughs> well, you can hey, just you you just go with, you with no who, comment. Who you, yeah, you can say yeah. no comment. So He's no, 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 I'm not gonna no guy. comment. Are you kidding me? I'll, I'll give you a good comment. So when my first day on the job as a Tigers manager three years ago was Michigan Michigan State Day, and Ooh. they asked me that like, hey, who's gonna win now? I'm not. I, I did no comment that day because I'm like, you guys might not like me yet. You got, like, at least gotta get in front of you a little bit. Um, we are go blue on our staff because of Chris Fetter and Michael Bedar, uh, two ex Michigan alums, uh, both coach there, both, both, um, played there. They, they they love their life. So I'm, I'm pro Harbaugh, I'm pro Michigan. That doesn't make me anti-Spartan like Michigan state. We still love you when you come to tiger games, but, um, we're rooting for Michigan this weekend. There you go. There and you just go. so you know, there you go. Mize was with us, and of course, uh, Przinsky's our college football guy, and he said he was watching them lose on uh, win on the plane and then lose, and he said there's Bama fans behind him cheering. It was a disaster. He said like worst day of his life. So you yeah, can I think, get all I think over the text to me was I'm broken. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he seemed broken too, and he lost all his poker chips wherever he was playing too. I mean, it was for fun. It was a charity event, but. Um, all right, so last one here. I want to run this because Jason Benetti is the new Tigers broadcaster. And what he said about the city of Detroit, I thought really resonated. I'm sure you saw it. We just have a little clip of it that we'll show everyone and, and then get your thoughts before, before we go. So here it is. People think I can't do stuff. And from a distance, again, gross generalization alarm going off. But from a distance, I think that's how Detroit gets treated. I think quite often... Detroit is not known for its passionate fans or what it's done for the music industry. I think people reduce Detroit to a couple of statistics. And I don't like seeing people and a whole place get reduced to anything. And I know how much people care. And I know like how much people here want to just matter and be seen for what they are and not some overgeneralization. So to me, as I've thought about this, like that is where we link up. And that is why, you know, They'll make the decision on me. Like, I can't say we're going to be the best of friends right away because that's super presumptuous of me. So, AJ, what did you think when you saw that, you know, him specifically on the city? Amazing. I mean, amazing feel for the city. Um, tremendous um, confidence in in being vulnerable. Like, I mean, Benetti's like a star. And he's a star because he's, a, he's an unbelievable human Mm -hmm. um, he connects well with a lot of different people. I mean, I was a visiting manager. I, he always came in and, and told me, you know, told me stories and talked to me a little bit and, and gathered information on our team. And um, now I get to work side by side with him. I got to sit down and have dinner with him um, on the on the front end of him getting hired as, as he was learning our organization. And man, I'm thrilled. Like he's such a such a good person to to represent the Tigers and represent our broadcast and and ultimately, um, when he's vulnerable like that, like, can any of us really not, you know, kind of fall in love with his story and his grind and his his ability to do his job at the top shelf level, uh, despite all the challenges that he's had to overcome? Man, I'm I'm all I'm all for for Team Benetti. Yeah, I love that. Awesome. AJ, thank you so much for joining us, dude. Enjoy the holidays and the winter meetings, Bonanza. And uh, good luck on, you know, all the signings and trades that go down here for the ball club. And thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. AJ Hinch, Detroit Tigers manager with us on FT Live. That was awesome. <laughs>